Well, I'll leave you with one saying um, and something I always like to think about. You know, complex problems require simple solutions. Um, and when you think like that, you always end up with better results. to the Financial Innovations Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Daniel Villani. We're helping CFOs save money and time by uh, implementing cutting edge technology. I'm here with Martin Petrino. Uh, Martin, it's great to have you on the show. Daniel, thanks very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Really excited to be here. Uh, so Martin, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, finance transformation and you know the importance of keeping employees engaged throughout the process? Daniel. Um, A former CEO once told me that it's about people, numbers, and numbers, people. And I used to always wonder around what that meant. And I had the opportunity to ask him one day. um, And he told me that people are the ones that make the numbers happen. And then when you look at the numbers, it tells you something about the people. So when you're wanting to drive finance transformation, um, it is about the results, Um, And to achieve those results, you need to be sure that you have that team around you, surrounding yourself with people that are better and smarter than you, Um, you putting your best people on your biggest problems. Um, Driving finance transformation initiatives is not about the individual. It's about about that team. Um, And it starts with the words. Um, And I always say that the words matter. Um, And your team listen to those words in terms of what you are saying. It captures, it captures the mind, it captures uh, the vision that you're wanting to achieve. Um, so you need to be able to set that, uh, trans- that aspirational vision for the future. Um, I remember when I came to the U.S. Um, in 2015, I was often asked what it was like to work um, like in China. I used to work in China. Um, and at that time, um, the air quality in China was really poor. And I used to drive about an hour to work in a taxi. Um, And often with the air quality being so poor, you couldn't see two, three meters ahead of you. But the taxi driver was able to weave in between the traffic and get me to work uh, safely on time. Um, And one day I reflected on that. uh, And what I could see is that as the driver drove a little bit further forward, he could see that further distance in front of him and was able to make a decision to move left, to move right, to slow down or to speed up. Um, And that's essentially what it's uh, all about. You don't see much in front of you, but you need to have that vision in front of you that you can actually talk to your team about. Um, Often not necessarily need to know the details, but you need to know where you're going. The key is knowing that direction, having the team around you and to be able to um, move forward. Yeah, that's that's a great point, you know, and, and I think that a lot of organizations fall into the trap of do we wait till we have too much to find up front? right before we get started with our, you know, transformation, or do we just kind of wing it and make it up as, as we go. Right. And, and it sounds like, you know, what you're, you're saying is, you know, there's, there's somewhere in between, you know, somewhere on that spectrum that, um, you know, is the right balance between the two where, you know, if you wait until you have everything figured out, then you've, you've waited too long. Right. If you're just kind of, you know, Hey, somebody told us we need dashboards today. So we're just going to go implement dashboards without, um, you know, thinking through the implications or what that means, then, um, you know, we probably would benefit from putting a little bit of time up front, you know, into that. Um, Where is that, you know, where do you see that, um, that balance happening? Um, Well, you need to be able to show your employees where you're going. Um, Often, as you say correctly, we get stuck in those, in those details to try and plan out every little step. Um, and what you find is that you don't know all the answers um, and you don't keep your head up front looking as to what's in front of you. Um, so as I said earlier, you know, as that taxi driver moved forward, I could see what he was doing. He was going a little left, a little right. What I always found is that what is important is you need to know the direction. As long as you've got the direction right and you've got the team around you, you're able to get there in really small steps. Um, But the balance is to make sure that your team can connect to that vision. You need to be very simple in your message. And what's really important in that simple message is that you consistently repeat the message using visuals and simple language, but repeating it consistently. Uh, When you have a team that is global, that is multicultural from different parts of the world, you need to often bear that in mind. You know, as people connect to words very differently, 
and you need to make sure that you think that through as you deliver a message. Um, you can't drive a transformational change just out of one region or one country. Where you have a global operation, you need to make sure that a whole team is behind you through all the layers in the organization. In order to reach the simple message that you repeat, often visuals that are easy to understand and connect to. Um, and then what you often find as you're going through that process is you find individuals within those teams that once they connect, they come up with the great ideas, they put their hands up, they want to get involved, and that's how you start making that progress to be able to drive that change. But they do look to you to be able to visualize what is out there in front of them. If there's a goal, if some future thing that is better, a situation or a process that's going to become simplified, we're going to save some time through this application um, or this approach, uh, the team connects to that and they give you the space and time to be able to get there. So that ability to have a really simple message, simple words that you repeat often helps everybody to connect and actually get you there. Yeah, no, that's great. And and in terms of the team dynamic, like who who do you ensure is on that team? Is it, you know, is it business at first? Is it business in IT? Is it, you know, are there other people that like who, who do you typically try to get involved? It, it depends on what you're trying to solve. Um, you know, often the type of problems I face, um, they're not just accounting or finance related. You need to be well integrated uh, with business leaders that are making decisions. Um, and usually you find that that's really what we are doing, is we taking data, we convert it to information, and we help to package that in a way that we can have some insights that help you to get to a better decision. Um, often that does require the IT folks to be with you. Um, what you do not want to do is come up with a great idea and you get to the end and then you call your IT team and they say, well, that's either too expensive, it's going to take a long time, we don't have the resources. So you want to make sure that up front you think that through, who are all those stakeholders that you have and bringing them along with the journey. Often then you do find the good input that comes along the way. It helps you to have a better product, better solution, quicker, and often it's cheaper to do it that way. So bringing IT folks earlier really critical. The other part of it is that uh, many times I see that uh, within finance, we will sit even with the IT team together, uh, come up with the idea, talk to our business partner, and they're not really interested. Um, you know, information may be uh, interesting to look at, but doesn't help to drive better decisions. So really important is to bring your business partners along, making sure that we understand what information they need to drive better decisions. So keeping engagement with the business is also critical through that planning process. Yeah, no, those those are great points. And, you know, and a couple of things that I think of that kind of stem from that is, you know, organizations that that I see and have seen that have been very successful or more successful than others have been ones that have brought IT in early because a lot of organizations see IT as the enemy and the one that's going to, you know, crush our dream um, of, uh, you know, of, of all these great technology that we want to put in play, right? And and just to, you know, when that's A, not the case, they're there to, to help, but B, that, you know, you got to make sure that you're structurally sound in terms of the technology that, you know, that you're built on, um, you know, and, and it's a, it's a collaboration. And, you know, the other thing that I thought of, you know, as you were, as you were talking there is just um, in terms of getting, you know, the business, the, the key stakeholders involved early, you know, different people like to see different things in a, in a transformation. There's, there's the one that's a, you know, Hey, let's do a small proof of concept to, to see if this is worth, you know, investing time into before, you know, we go and spend $5 million on a transformation. And then there's the one that's a, well, doing a small proof of concept where we're going to prove out that we saved five hours of time really isn't going to make me interested in doing this. Let's do the, you know, the big transformation over there, um, you know, and, and let's get $10 million a year in cost savings uh, from a $5 million investment, you know, and, and, really bringing the the right people on from the beginning is going to help you with um you know which which approach do you have to take or or should you take as you're as you're looking to connect with with the team um you you're right to that and uh, there's no one answer that i think fits every situation uh, sometimes you do need to do the proof of concept because maybe that investment is very large and if you go too far down what you end up finding is pulling back is really tough 
And if you're not doing the thinking along the way, you don't design the solution correctly, you don't think about some of the consequences that you can then build into that solution. Uh, but at times you don't have that time um, and you need to move a lot quicker. Uh, so having the ability to work a little more abstractly where you don't have all the information, you can work through that cloud, as I mentioned, around the taxi driver driving through the thick smog. Uh, you need to move forward, get more data, more information, make adjustments. You know, that agile approach um, can work really well with some solutions as well. You tend to bring people along through the process where people can actually see what's going on, see the results, buy into it, and then add to that improvement. Um, you get that engagement uh, throughout the process rather than waiting for some large event. Um, but you've got to be really thoughtful about what's going to work in what situation. Um, and that's what's really important, that upfront thinking, not the rushing. Uh, once you've thought it through, you can move at a pace, um, but you've got to think through that solution up front. Yeah. And, and you know, the, it also just, uh, you know, highlights too that, you know, when you start you know, when you bring the right people on board and you don't have the solution fully, you know, baked out from the beginning and things have to be figured out, well, you know, the the people on the team are the ones that are going to help you figure it out. They help solve problems and figure out some of the details. They're going to feel more invested in the end solution. And it's not a, you came up with the vision, you had all the answers. Now everyone has to follow, you know, your orders and what you what you said to do. It's a matter of collectively, we, you know, we all solved this problem together. We all came up with the solution. You know, this is, this is our solution. This isn't, you know, your, your solution that you, you know, dictated onto us. Yes. And that word we so, so important. You know, we talk a lot about change management when you drive a finance a transformation initiative. One sees that as a separate process. It is not. You get your team involved throughout the decision-making steps there's opportunity for them to provide input. They buy in, they become the champions, and that's how you then start driving the change. And that is super critical. Where you've got a number of people engaged in that process, you can be really successful with a complex transformation. And change management is just the way that we work. Um, and you will have your change agents throughout that process uh, with individuals that you probably didn't even know about. Um, and they might be sitting in a different country you know, different continent, but are bought into your vision. And they're the ones that are helping to speak and helping to get the engagement that you need. Um, and it's really good when you see that um, number of people driving that outcome. Yeah. And, you know, change management is is definitely something that's extremely important and, you know, often overlooked, uh, you know, in, in my experience where, you know, a lot of companies, you know, they they do a, a, a transformation and, you know, maybe they're running a little over budget and they look at what things to cut and it's, uh, hey, get rid of the documentation, get rid of the training, you know, we'll train the trainer and you guys will figure it out, right? And and the and the customers in a spot where, well, you know, everyone was told six months ago that something was coming, but, you know, there's been no communication since, there's been no training, we don't know what we're doing, you know, and, and it's, uh, it, it's one of those things to, you know, to save you know, $20,000, you went and uh, threw away a, a million dollar project uh, out there. And you're, you're, and I've seen that before where, um, you know, one does take those shortcuts. And in the end, what you end up happening, it costs you a lot more. Uh, because what you find is that through that process, if people don't understand what you're doing, are not engaged, or feel like we are not training and providing that support through the change management process, They'll disengage, maybe leave, and now you've invested a lot uh, in training and developing, and you've lost your talent. Um, so it's keep doing that work up front, making sure you continue with that in the process is really important. Yeah, and and a lot of companies kind of look at any kind of transformation as more of a bookend of like, you know, let's get the beginning right, let's get the the rollout right at the end, and you know, the middle kind of gets ignored in terms of uh, you know, let's make sure that people along the journey know that. Hey, we're all in this together. We're, you know, we're all figuring things out together. We're all learning together and 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 adapting and you know, making sure that, you know, come the end that, you know, a, a successful rollout is not just about, hey, we had a kickoff meeting and we had a rollout meeting and, and now we're done, right? Right, right. And one sees that often. You're 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 right with that. It's not about the beginning and the end, it's about that process in the middle um, and having the right approach. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just shifting gears a little bit, you know, I know, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, we're excited to talk about today is just in terms of automation in general and, 
you know, um, taking, you know, manual processes and, you know, looking at, um, can we automate them? And, you know, I, I think that um, there are some organizations that are over automators, I'll, I'll say for lack of a better word, where, you know, it's a, that one time process that's going to take a half hour, they went and they spent a week building an automated process, and it's never going to, you know, be run again after that one time, right? And then there's the, uh, the under automators that are, you know, everything is manual and, uh, and, and all that, you know, so I think maybe we could start out by talking a little bit about um, you know, when you're looking at, you know, automation in general, what are the things that we try to automate? Like, like, where's that balance of, you know, what are you looking at to say, is this worth, you know, even looking into a, a potential to, to automate? Well, I always found that it's uh, very tempting to jump in and just to automate. Um, it's the more the cool stuff of finance. Um, we like the technology. We believe in saving the time and then repurposing that time. Um, you know, developing those dashboards, a lot of good skills that are coming out uh, in terms of Power BI usage. Um, and it's really exciting when you see that. Um, what I've found, though, is that it's that upfront thinking in making a decision before you automate. What you want to automate is so critical. There's a few steps that you need to follow. And I don't think it's anything uh, revolutionary, uh, but it's really applying those lean principles that uh, we drive particularly through manufacturing and bringing them into finance. When we talk about things like simplification and standardization, just imagine if you take a really complex model, we call our IT partner in and say, well, automate this, you're going to save me a week here. Um, and they don't understand what they're doing. It's too complex. What you get back in the end is something that potentially just doesn't work, has actually costed a lot more time and potentially costed some money as well. So making sure that we follow those steps of standardization, simplification, something that is easy to repeat, something that uh, makes sense, um, is probably the starting point. And that part is where the hard work lies. Looking at the process, how do we shorten it? Um, and then what I like to call around elimination of the waste. Often you find duplication of work, fragmentation of processes and different parts of work that are coming together in a, in a single spreadsheet. We need to go through the steps of defragmenting, bringing things together, simplifying, standardizing. Once you get to that point is when you're ready to think about automation. Um, because the way you want to think about automation is what value it's going to drive. Is it really about time saving? And I agree, time saving is part of the answer, but that cannot only be the reason why we're automating. We need to look at the information that we're automating. Is this going to allow us to get to information quicker? which means you can make decisions earlier. So think about when you're closing the books and you're starting to do a consolidation, maybe it takes you a week to do that. And only then midway in the month, you're making decisions about the month and the quarter. If you could do that in day two or day three, fantastic. You get ahead of the month, you can actually still influence results. So where you're then dedicating resources um, and investing to automate um, processes that get you to information quicker, Super important to think about what is it that we're automating? Is it interesting information or is it insightful and it's going to drive a decision? And is that decision allowing us to get ahead? Um, so I often like to tell the team, you know, we're we just looking at being able to automate the process that tells us what happened in the month. That's not exciting. You know, are we going one step further and automating a process that's telling us, you know, why something happened in the month or why did this result happen in the month? That's important. So now I start listening. But where it gets really interesting, where you're able to automate processes, gather information and start looking ahead to think about what could happen next week or what could happen in a, the quarter, that's when you start driving a lot of value. So thinking about what you're going to automate and what benefit that drives, that is really critical as you still initially do simplification, standardization, simplify or eliminate the waste. You find you save a lot of time through that. But automation, you should keep to those things that you're going to drive value through decision making. And that's usually how I like to separate that. As you start thinking about it, you dedicate your time to something that's got some value. Yeah, no, that's great because, you know, I, I see a lot of companies implementing automation for the sake of automation, right? And, and a lot of it's driven by big vendors that say, oh, RPA, you know, robotic process automation is the is the buzzword of the day, go and buy our software and, and do this, right? And then they start like 
automating things like, you know, copying data from one system to another in there and, and all of that. And, you know, and, and they're doing these things as proof of concepts of can you save five hours by automating this? Sure, you can save five hours. But to your point of was this even something worth automating to begin with? Is this going to, you know, bring business value? And now, you know, before you know it, you have 5,000 software robots running around uh, going and, and doing things. And, you know, you don't even know what's what's happening when it's happening. It's just, you know, all happening behind the scenes versus being a little bit more strategic, which I think is what you're recommending of, you know, hey, what are the, you know, what are the pieces that, you know, while time savings is great and it's going to lead to, you know, inherent benefits, but, you know, how do we prioritize by looking at strategically, what are the things that are going to bring us the most value? And it's not in terms of how many hours can we save by automating this process? It's more in terms of the what capabilities is this going to open us up to, in or, you know, by implementing this technology? And that is uh, that is spot on right. And the other consideration you need to have is um, from an employee perspective, some employees are really attached to those manual processes and the manual spreadsheets, and they could feel a little threatened as you go through this process of automation. So you've got to be thinking about what you're going to do with that time. How are we going to repurpose the time that frees up? Otherwise, you will have an idle employee that starts thinking and is not productive. So at the same time as you're going through this process and engaging the team, thinking about what are we going to repurpose the time on? How are we going to drive insights out of the data that comes out? How do we connect these individuals to business leaders, make work very meaningful for them? When you run those two processes in parallel is when you really get to a good result. If you think about that too late, you'll find a disengaged team um, at the end of that and you wonder, well, what happened? A lot of people with free time don't know what to do. They were used to doing these manual processes for a long time. Right. I mean, the, the other question that comes up, too, is, you know, how do we ensure that, you know, the, the there's a lot of domain knowledge in the space and, and a lot of companies are you know automating a lot of the pieces. And, you know, you have this army of robots uh, and, and soon AI with uh, with all of the, you know, the chat GPT, uh, you know, uh, believers and everything in there with, uh, you know, well, how do we ensure that we've implemented all this technology and now we have we don't have anyone in the company that knows, you know, some of the insights that, you know, of what went into certain processes because a robot's handling it behind the scenes, you know, and, and how do we ensure that we have the right maintenance in place that, you know, that's great that we have these robots. They're very, you know, they can be very accurate in some cases, but everything can break. Everything can, uh, you know, ha have an issue with it. And how do we ensure that there's someone out there that knows what, these processes are doing such that, you know, if something breaks, that it can be quickly addressed? Um, that's a fantastic question. And probably something that, you know, at least many of us finance leaders have not properly thought through on some of the consequences on all this as we're just starting out in this process. Um, I would say is what I'm seeing is that the profile of a traditional finance person is changing. You know, skills, particularly technology skills that maybe a couple of years ago we're not that important are becoming more and more important. I let's focus about the accounting knowledge and the ability to work with data, understand how data is put together, systems, being able to write query language in, in order for us to be able to look at the information and make decisions on that. So that's one thing that you start seeing around a change in the dynamic of the skill set that you're bringing into a team that you probably would not have done a couple of years ago. And then it still keeps down to the basics. Documentation is super important. Making sure that we still, despite what's happening in the background, are able to document the processes, processes that can survive any one individual so that any new person can come in, picks up the standard work, picks up the process, and is able to understand how things come together. But often, as I said, that requires a different skill set that can look at the the data that can look at how things get put together and actually understands what's happening and can jump in to then start helping to solve problems. Um, so I'm seeing those two dynamics. The traditional way of documenting is still there, but also the skill set that one needs is evolving. What I've also seen as you've got employees that maybe have been around for quite a while, um, starting to learn those new skills. So there's a lot of uh, good material out, uh, whether it's on YouTube, you, you're able to then able, or through LinkedIn learning as well, you're able to draw some knowledge through these uh, tools that are out there. You need to skill yourself up. 
And that's a responsibility that you then have. Those that evolve through this process can keep up. Uh, but as you sort of think ahead the next couple of years, it's going to change and it's going to change very quickly. And we all need to adapt to that uh, to make sure that not only we stay ahead, but we can actually deliver the results, uh, you know, as a finance organization. Yeah, it, it's great that, that you mentioned that because, you know, there's, uh, you know, I work with a lot of companies and, you know, there's some companies I, I, I'll i talk to the VP of finance or CFO and, you know, they'll they'll be like, all right, yeah, I just need some just work your magic. They think technology is just magic and it's happening behind the scenes and, you know, go build me a dashboard that does this. Right. And then, you know, we had a guest on the show a few weeks back that, um, you know, he's going and talking about data lakes and, 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 you know, data warehouses and AI in here and AI in there. And, and it's, you know, you, you start to see that, you know, Hey, here's, here's someone who's equipped for, um, a fin finance transformation versus, you know, the one that kind of thinks that, hey, this is all just magic that happens behind the scenes and, you know, doesn't quite know, um, you know, is, is, is probably not going to be very successful, uh, you know, in a, in a, you know, full blown transformation. And you may want to take it, you know, individual project by individual project rather than as, you know, one, one big overhaul over there. So, you know, staying up to date with, you know, learning, making sure that, um, you understand, you know, you don't have to know how to write code per se, but um, you should understand the what are what are some of these technologies that are happening, you know, behind the scenes. And, you know, I know you mentioned LinkedIn Learning is a great way of, um, you know, staying up to up to speed on things. You know, what um, resources and recommendations do you uh, do you have for people to just, you know, kind of stay on that that cutting edge of, of technology? Yeah, and um, often I see those employees that do well. Nowadays, um, are those with those attitudes that uh, they're willing to learn, um, are open to inputs and doing things differently. Those that can transform, you find that they actually do really well in an organization that wants to adapt finance transformation, technical tools to come in. Um, and, you know, when I talk to them, you can see they're out on the Internet trying to research and understand what is out there. There's a lot of material that there is. Um, you know, as I mentioned, sort of with LinkedIn learning or through YouTube videos, um, there's a lot of self-learning you can do and bring it in with some really creative ideas. And that's what you look for in a team that you put together around you. Not, not one individual knows all the answers, but when you have a collection of individuals that are doing their piece, uh, you can get to quite a, an impactful result in the end. It drives engagement throughout the team. People are motivated. And the end result is a lot better than one person trying to pull this whole thing along because um, some take time with technology others like to run ahead and you need the right balance because a large multinational is often not ready for all the technology we've got old systems that don't integrate different erps we all want one instance with a big data lake and that doesn't always uh, happen and it's it's very costly and we've got to work sometimes with what we have and still transform still improve still drive technology um, so one has to also be realistic with what you have around you. Um, otherwise, you'll be waiting and you won't be moving forward. And if you're not moving, there's no progress. Um, and if there's no progress, you don't get there. Uh, so that's really critical is that you need to keep moving forward, bring that team along. Yeah. And making sure that, you know, that team is on but from the beginning, like you said earlier in the in the episode here, just because, you know, there a lot of companies out there get their information of like, what should I be, you know, implementing next from, a vendor calling them up and saying, hey, you should buy my product. And it's, you know, if you start asking them the question of why do I need this and, and all of that, and then you're just taking their word for it. Well, they want to sell you something. They're going to tell you you need it no matter what, right? Versus having that independent group, you know, that trusted source internally where you can say, hey, look, they're, you know, they're, they're telling me that if I don't implement this particular product that, you know, I, all of our competitors are going to overtake us. Is this the real deal? You know, getting that kind of, um, you know, second opinion, third opinion, you know, doing your own research out there to make sure that, you know, hey, look, is this something that I really need versus, you know, this is just the buzzword that everyone's, you know, trying to sell me a product on today. And um, often what you find is that different solutions have got the same problems because you've got underlying data that's feeding these different solutions. And if you're not thinking about the underlying data, simplification, standardization, things we've already spoken about, you're going to get the same output in the end, perhaps in a different form. It looks different, but it's going to end up being in the same space. So it's really important that whilst it's quite exciting to jump into the automation, um, the AI, 
you need to still take a step back and make sure that you're doing the basics right. Um, nothing can be said around how important it is to get the basics right. Often we don't want to do that, but the value that's driven to put the time in to do that pays dividends in the end. Actually, you get a more engaged team because when they see the output in the end, everybody's connected. We're not complaining about the manual work to feed the system. Things make sense. And then when you connect with the business leaders and they see the value of the information, everyone is driving with better decisions, better decisions drive better results. And that is really important to me. Yeah, it, it, it's funny that you said that. I was thinking of, you know, they show you those those images of the, the icebergs, right, where there's the little piece that's above the water and then the giant mountains that are underneath, right? And often, oftentimes companies are, you know, kind of getting lost in the, well, I only want to invest in the piece I can see and improving there and, you know, things like the database, the, you know, making sure data is consistent and accurate, you know, in your storage, you know, gets often overlooked. And, the answer to a lot of those problems, you know, vendor, oh, just buy this product and this is going to do solve this. Oh, no, buy this one and that's going to solve, you know, the other area you're lacking. And you end up spending all this money on different products and you're making the problem worse because your data that's not all, you know, centralized and, and easy to access and, you know, accurate and all of that just becomes, you know, split to more and more systems versus, uh, you know, uh, just making sure that, you know, you're doing those basics right, that you're getting that, you know, all the things that you may not be able to see uh, in order before you start taking on the initiative, going and buy, you know, investing in AI when you've got data across 50 different databases uh, may not uh, lead to the results that you're hoping for it to lead um, until you get to the point where, you know, some of those things that are not so visible get um, taken care of. Um, you know, you, you reminded me of, um, you know, an advert I used to see when I was growing up in South Africa, and it was around dishwashing liquid, and their catchphrase was, seeing is believing. Um, and I think within finance, we often have that. We, we want to see it to believe it. We are skeptical by nature. Uh, we trust, but we want to verify. Um, and sometimes that's our limitation. We want to go to the end. We want to see it. Um, what's important, though, it's that step before. Um, the success of what we do is based on what that input is, um, making sure that we got that step before and things we perhaps don't see, uh, that data that's feeding it, is it simple, is it standard? The work that goes around there really drives the success in the end. Um, the tools and the visuals are great, but that data, the documentation is super critical. And that I don't think goes away. And making sure that that process is in place, you know, just applying technology to a broken process doesn't fix the process. It, it, it you know, might hide and conceal and put a Band-Aid on, on there. But, you know, making sure that to your point, you know, the, you know, one of the key themes I've taken out of this, uh, you know, is really just focusing on the fundamentals and making sure that structurally everything's kind of sound before you, you know, embark on, on some of these initiatives. and. You know, a lot of people will invest in the tool that puts the Band-Aid on because what they see appears to be better than uh, than what it was before versus did we really fix the problem by, you know, investing in this initiative or, or that initiative? Right. That's why I say sometimes seeing is believing, but it's right. not always so. Right. <laughs> No, that's great. I mean, th this has been, you know, this has been a great, um, you know, conversation and, you know, appreciate, um, you know, the time and, you know, encourage our, our audience here, you know, really to, to follow the show, to, you know, subscribe to it because, you know, we have a lot of great guests that, that, you know, that are great in, you know, many different areas and similar areas and, you know, encourage you all to follow the show. Um, as we move kind of into the last piece of, uh, of, of, of the, uh, the episode here, you know, I just want to talk through, um, you know, inspiration and being an inspiring leader um, in finance. And, you know, I've I've learned so much, you know, from you in this episode. So, you know, you you strike me as someone who is um, inspiring teams and, you know, want to, you know, kind of learn from your experience in terms of, you know, how do others, um, you know, that are in that that same similar role looking to be in that same similar role um, you know, kind of be inspiring to the team. And even as you're, you know, transitioning roles, how do you kind of kind of keep that going? Well, I've recently started a new role at uh, Terrace Corporation. And um, I know when I started the role, I was equally excited and apprehensive at the same time. 
um, excited because it's something new and you've got these ideas of what you want to do. You've got a strategy, you want to build your team. Uh, so things that you really look forward to and drive you with a lot of energy. Um, but apprehensive because you've got to do it all again. All again. Uh, perhaps what was successful in a prior role may not be successful again. The company is different. The culture is different. It's a different team. Um, and probably something that we don't think about often when we change roles is you've lost all your goodwill. That credibility that you've built up over many years where you used to say something and people listen, it all goes away. You've got to start it all again. So it's important to come into a new role, understanding that um, and thinking about that. Um, and maybe as a story to understand, you know, I've, uh, I still remember my first day uh, of work when I went into uh, China, um, got into the office. Um, and as one does on the first day of work, you meet everyone uh, in the office. And towards the end of the day, uh, one of the directors walked into my office and started telling me how difficult this new job was going to be telling me how good the person was that previously had the role. The individual had a lot of credibility. Uh, people knew him, respected him. Um, and in the end, uh, the director looked at me, pointed the finger uh, with a loud voice, said, Martin, you've got big shoes to fill here. Um, and I remember thinking about it. Uh, I took a deep breath and then I said, well, I brought my own pair of shoes. Um, and I think that that is what's important is that as you're coming into a new role, understanding that you bring your own set of experiences, you bring your own set of mistakes that you've learned for, you've seen successes, you've seen what good looks like. And that's what then inspires you coming into a new role. It's not about where you've worked or where you've come from. It's about those experiences that you can share and you can lead a team with. People want to learn. People want to grow, but they want to hear from you. And that's really what's important in coming into a new role, to have that clarity about where you're going, bringing those experiences forward, but realizing that it's going to be different. You can leverage them, but you need to be able to adapt. So whilst um, it's important that you bring those shoes with you, I think what's also very important, and that's where the magic lies, is knowing where you're walking and understanding that, because that allows you to adapt and then be effective in what you want to do. And that's what I found really helps me as I'm transitioning the roles and re-engaging a team, rebuilding the credibility and the goodwill. That takes a long time to do, uh, but it's super critical when you're driving a team. Yeah. You know, when, whenever I see, um, you know, new leaders coming into, you know, organizations and, you know, it, it's, there are a few different kinds of reactions that happen, right? There's the Oh, hey, this person just came in and wants to overhaul everything and change every everything that we've been doing, right? And so you get some people that uh, freak out a little bit in terms of they think that you know everything that they've gotten used to over the last you know however many years is going to change. Um, they're the ones that are the hey, you know, let's wait and see what happens, right? And and there's you know a, a spectrum in in between there of you know all that. You know how, how do you um, you know, come in and, and um, work with, you know, kind of the varying um, reactions and personalities that, that might come with it, you know, while you're establishing your credibility and, you know, how do, how do you kind of keep everyone, uh, you know, calm and, and, and more, you know, embracing of the change rather than, you know, maybe being a little bit resistant? Um, that's a really good point. And the answers uh, differ, um, you know, as you go into different organizations and they work differently. Um, one thing that I keep always in mind is that as you enter a new role, you need to accept that your performance will slow down. It's going to drop from what you were used to. Whether it's your output or the pace that you do things, you need to recognize that. Um, the next thing that I usually like to think through is just the process in terms of you start engaging your teams. You start with your own employees. Um, and I always say that that's where you got to start out. Then you move to your peers. And then you look at leaders and bosses. And that's important in that sequence is that you want to lay those foundations right. You want your team behind you before you start looking sideways and you start looking up. Sometimes we make the mistake of coming into a role and we're just thinking about the boss that you've got, not about the team. You drive your team very hard. You come up with ideas that perhaps previously worked, not listening to your team members, why things are done the way they are, making assumptions. And then normally what you see at the end of that is, is a failure. Somebody doesn't last, they leave very quickly. And you can often see that. So thinking through, stepping back, thinking about your team first, 
Then you look at your peers, which is super critical. And those relationships are sometimes the most difficult ones to develop. Um, and then you look at the leaders and the bosses, um, which is perhaps counterintuitive for some, but I've always found that you lay that foundation, your dip in performance will be a short term thing. You'll be able to really turn it around and deliver uh, an exceptional output. Uh, but thinking through those steps, I found really helps. Yeah, I, I, I really like that approach because, you know, a lot of leaders come into a role and, you know, they say, all right, you know, my bosses want me to, you know, I was hired to do these three things and they come in with, you know, pedal to the metal, because if I don't do it, then, uh, you know, it's going to look bad on me and I'm going to get a poor review or, or this or that, you know, for, for whatever reason, the expectation of me is to drive these changes and, and it leads to, you know, maybe making change a little bit quicker than you should in the organization leading to, you know, people, getting that perception of, oh, hey, this person came in, just wants to overhaul everything, rip everything out and, and start over um, versus, you know, with your approach of, you know, starting with the people that are reporting to you, understanding them, understanding their goals, what they're looking to do, starting to build that credibility from day one of, you know, hey, look, I'm not looking to make your life harder or, you know, change everything on you, you know, on day one you know, here and, and then, you know, kind of establishing the goals of, you know, here's what's kind of expected of our group and here's how we're going to, you know, get there together, you know, prior to the, you know, hey, look, this is a, a KPI for me and, and, and I'm expected to do this and let me just run in and do it. That, that's spot on, right? Uh, you know, one of the most important roles I find I have is to be able to provide cover for my team um, and give them the space. Usually they can get you there, um, but you need to be able to provide that cover. You know, otherwise you're running a lot of firefighting, you are stressing the team out. So providing that buffer and that cover allows them to be able to perform and take your input and direction. And also coming into a new role, one can't underemphasize the importance of listening, learning, and then combining your ideas. So those shoes that are, I talked about, knowing where you're walking is so important because that allows you to adapt and that allows you to take input and learn and then we get to a better outcome that way. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Um, great insight over there. Um, and, you know, I know we talked about a few different, you know, topics here today. And um, I know we're getting towards the end of, of our episode over here. But, you know, are there any other, um, you know, nuggets of wisdom or, or any lessons learned uh, that, you know, you want to share with the, the audience here before we wrap up? Well, I'll leave you with one saying. Um, and something I always like to think about, you know, complex problems require simple solutions. Um, and when you think like that, you always end up with better results. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I think, uh, you know, I myself sometimes fall into that category of trying to over-engineer um, solutions over there and, and having to take that step back and say, you know, how do we simplify it? So that's definitely great, great advice. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, if, if our, our audience wants to, you know, reach out, what's the best way to contact you? Is it LinkedIn or do you have other? Probably you know, through link LinkedIn is probably the best, yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we'll we'll share that um, with uh, with the audience in case you know they have other questions or just want to connect and, um, and, and and chat. I mean, I've learned a lot from uh, from this episode. Uh, I know everyone watching will as well. So you know, thanks for uh, for coming on the show. Uh, you know, we appreciate you spending the time with us. Thank you very much. I'm really happy you had me on the show.